and into the next few months are canceled. So I love when there's flexibility to um, continue with plans that we had. So thanks to our host tonight. So my job is to provide an overview and an introduction to knotweed and kind of to invasive plants in general. There's a picture of me outside. I'm in my office right now. We're lucky enough um, to be residents of the Adnac Fieldhouse in Adnac Park in Vancouver. And it's a fairly small space and we've currently implemented a, a one person at a time in the office policy. So Mondays are my day. So I'm lucky enough to be here. You can see our little kitchen behind me. Um, probably one of the few people that is not currently at home. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do and a little bit about what invasive species are and some of the impacts they're having and some of the possible management solutions that we're using. And then I'm going to get into knotweed, some of the facts, how to identify the different knotweed species, some of the specific management options I'll summarize for you. And then our other guest presenters are going to follow up with a bit more detail on that. And I have a bunch of resources and some upcoming events that I want to share with you as well. So there are a number of links that I'm gonna share in the presentation, which I don't believe will actually work if you try and link on them during my presentation because I'm just actually sharing my screen. But because the, the session is being recorded, you can go back later and find some of those links because unfortunately some of them are quite lengthy. So they're hard to capture really quickly. Um, and my contact information is at the end of the presentation as well. And I hope that if you have any additional questions or any ways that I can support the work that you're doing after today, that you will contact me. So a little bit about what I do. So I work for the Invasive Species Council of Metro Vancouver. We are a not-for-profit society established in 2006. And our job is essentially to improve the way that invasive species are managed in Vancouver. So my job is to help you do your job better and um, get invasives um, out of Metro Vancouver, at least minimize the impacts that they're having. So I answer a lot of questions. We host a lot of regional events and do presentations and um, essentially use outreach and education to spread the word about invasive species. We also do training with volunteers and with government staff and contractors. And we also operate a really small field that specializes in some of our most challenging invasive species, including the knotweeds. So I'm going to start out with a really kind of broad definition. What is an invasive species? Of course, we're focusing on knotweed today, but there are many, many invasive species that we deal with in Metro Vancouver. So my definition of an invasive species has two parts. The first part is that you have to be non-native. So that means you've come from somewhere else in the world. You've been introduced from another region of North America or possibly even another continent. And when you've been introduced here, you've been causing some sort of significant harm, maybe economic harm, maybe harm to human health or environmental harm. So you sort of have to be those two things. You have to be non-native and you have to be doing some sort of significant harm. And when we talk about non-native species, we're really talking about species that have been moved around on Earth because of human intervention. We expect the natural range of living things to change a bit over time, but we don't expect plants like knotweed to be able to travel from their native home in Asia to North America. So this whole conservation issue of invasive species is really due to um, human activity. And so if you're an invasive species and you've been introduced into a new environment that's not your native environment, generally in that new environment you will lack the natural controls and competition such as viruses or funguses or predators that would exist in your native environment and if you're able to reproduce and thrive you're often able to do so without any of these things in place and you can very quickly take over a habitat and there are all sorts of different kinds of invasive species any living thing can be invasive so i've got um, american bullfrog is an example of a local invasive amphibian Scotch room is another invasive plant that's common in our region, European fire ant, and the furry eastern gray squirrel, the most common squirrel that we find in our urban areas is actually invasive as well. But viruses and funguses and all sorts of things can be invasive as well. So what are some of the impacts they're having? Well, starting with ecological, our invasive plants are really utilizing space and resources 
that our native plants need. And so they're really having an impact on our native ecosystems. And with respect to knotweed, you can see in both of the photos on the slide there, knotweed is extremely aggressive and can grow in a variety of habitats. And you can see in the photos here where it's starting to take over riparian or, or creekside habitats. Once established, essentially invasive plants can displace surrounding vegetation. They can create dense monocultures where perhaps it is the only species that dominates in an area. They reduce biodiversity and in most cases our invasives provide less habitat and less food value than our native plants do. Some invasives also pose a health and safety impact. Again, we're focusing on knotweed today. I've got a picture of some knotweed growing very close to a building foundation. And knotweed actually does pose a number of health and safety concerns. So the rhizomes can damage concrete walls and pavement or bridge and building foundations. They can cause erosion of shorelines, which is a safety issue. They can also increase concern about safety in parks where you might have knotweed um, you know, overgrowing a certain trail or a certain area where you might want to keep clear for sight line issues. They can also cause, as in the, the bottom photo on the right hand side, the, these issues where they're, they're sloughing off streams and possibly undercutting adjacent roads or trails. Invasives also pose economic impacts and a rough estimate of the amount of money that local government agencies are spending on managing just the knotweeds in Metro Vancouver in a single year is over $660,000. And so those, that cost doesn't include any efforts that private landowners might be um, putting towards eradication of knotweed or um, any you know, non-government or volunteer work as well. So it's a huge amount of money. Invasive species are really a huge burden on all taxpayers, whether they know it or not. And definitely the knotweeds are sort of a top priority for land managers in the Metro Vancouver region. So a lot of people are spending a lot of money on, on managing knotweed. So where do invasives come from? Unfortunately, there's lots of different ways that these things can get introduced in the first place. Um, many of our invasives, including periwinkle on the upper left photo, is, are still commonly sold in garden centers and nurseries and big box stores and places like that. And so um, you could tomorrow um, purchase some of the invaders and introduce them into a new landscape. Also, any way that we move around, we could potentially be moving plant parts or in, invasive insects on us, whether it's on our hiking boots or on our gear or perhaps our pets. Um, once you have an invasive species on your property, it could easily spread into adjacent properties or if the seeds can spread further beyond the original infestation, they could perhaps be impacting um, sites much further away as well. And that bottom photo uh, in the middle is a, a picture of a moor that's a regular maintenance activity in our region, people's jobs it is to manage highways and roadsides. And we know that maintenance activities can actually spread some invasive species, including knotweed. And so that's why we have best practices for people who have those kinds of jobs. We want, to, we want them to understand what the invasive species are and how not to further spread them. So we have all these invasive things, what's the solution? We can definitely prevent new invaders from coming to our region and we can prevent the spread of the ones that we do have. We can undertake control and management activities. So that might include mechanical or manual control where you're physically digging, um, you know, pulling things up uh, or using a mower or some type of machine to remove plants. Um, chemical control is the use of herbicides or chemicals to kill plants um, or insects perhaps. Biological control is the, the use of a highly host-specific predator that will specifically feed on the target invasive. So often the example in BC is biological control agents are insects that are introduced into the environment to specifically feed on an invasive plant. Cultural control is changing the way that we manage plants or manage land in order to encourage desirable plants and to um, make it more difficult for invasive plants to move in. 
And then after control and management activities, we often want to undertake restoration. So we don't want the same invasive to come back and we certainly don't want other invasives to move in. And so often you need a plan for what's gonna to happen to that land next. Are you going to replant? Are you going to reseed? Um, was there gonna be development on that site? There might be different kinds of plans involved in restoration. And education is always a huge piece of what we do. So moving now into knotweeds specifically, they are a group of species that are native to Eastern Asia. And I mentioned earlier that they grow in a variety of different habitats. In their native environment, they're actually a first colonizer. So they're one of the species that would pop up after maybe some kind of natural disaster, a landslide or something like that. They don't need a lot to grow from. And so they're one of those first colonizers that can do really well without a lot of resources. Their rhizomes or root structure is very extensive, it can extend three meters deep into the ground and 20 meters laterally. A couple things that make knotweed notoriously difficult to manage is small portions of the stem or a root can regrow. So they say up to about two milligrams, which is probably about the size of the, my, my pinky fingernail. So a very, very small portion of, of these plants can propagate new plants and so they spread very easily. They can also spread by seeds, some of the species. They're notoriously difficult to control because of those extensive rhizome structures underneath the ground. The knotweeds are regulated noxious weeds in BC, which require land managers to um, remove them on their property. And here in Metro Vancouver, we're dealing with four species of knotweeds. And so I've got some photos and a diagram to show what those four species are. So we have Japanese knotweed, which is often what people call knotweeds in our region. They say Japanese knotweed. For many years, we thought that all we had was Japanese knotweed. And so that common name has really stuck. Um, but we also have giant knotweed, which as the name would imply is quite a bit larger. You can see the very first leaf on the diagram on the bottom is a, um, a diagram of the giant knotweed leaf. And then Japanese knotweed and giant knotweed can hybridize and their, their children are called bohemian knotweed. So the hybrids are bohemian knotweed. And as you would expect, the hybrid has a number of characteristics of both the parent species. So bohemian knotweed tends to have um, a varied leaf size and um, you know, sometimes can get really tall, but sometimes um, you know, fairly short. And there's some research to suggest that most of the knotweed that we have in Metro Vancouver is bohemian knotweed. We definitely have all four species, but we probably have the most of the bohemian. And then we also have a Himalayan knotweed, which you can see in the photo. Um, the leaves are a little bit different. It looks quite different than the other three species, but it's definitely still of concern in the region. Um, oftentimes when I'm talking about knotweed, because they're all very difficult to control and can be managed in much the same way and they're all having very similar impacts. I often collectively refer to them as the knotweeds. In some cases it doesn't even matter which species you're dealing with because your management solution is probably going to be the same no matter what species you're dealing with. So these photos and this diagram is available for you in a resource, an online resource that I'm going to share at the end of the presentation. As is these photos right here. So I encourage you as you're learning about plants in your neighborhood or areas where you work to get to know what they look like throughout the year. And definitely knotweeds are, are one of those species where you can really identify it at all times of the year here in Metro Vancouver. So the first photo is what knotweed looks like in the early spring as it's first emerging from the ground. So that's where we were a few weeks ago here in the region. And those first leaves, those little seedlings that are popping up often have a reddish color. They often look like little red lipstick tubes poking through the ground. And then very quickly in that second photo, you can see pretty much what I'm seeing nowadays out in the community. On my drive to work this morning, I saw some knotweed that looked about that tall, about a meter tall. And then it's going to continue to grow. And then in early summer, it'll, it'll be maybe up to two meters. And then late summer, fall, we'll start to see some of the flowers on the plants. 
And then in the winter time, all of the above ground vegetation dies off. So the rhizome structure, the roots underneath the ground essentially hibernate, that tissue is still living, but all the above ground stuff appears to be dead. But those canes, those dead knotweed canes, are still pretty distinctive even in the winter. So it's, it's pretty easy once you know what you're looking at to identify knotweed throughout the year. This is my little caricature that I sometimes use to um, describe knotweed in the sense that it's not your regular average backyard weed. When people are dealing with knotweed, um, there's so much to consider and people often think that it's you know a lovely looking plant maybe it's in their garden or something and um, they might try and treat it as they would another kind of weed in their garden um, but they might soon come to realize that knotweed is a very very special and scary plant so some of the things that we want to consider with knotweed um, is that prevention is always going to be the most effective and that's true for any invasive project that we might be undertaking. We want to avoid the spread of the plant, we want to avoid disturbance near the knotweed and we definitely want to avoid introducing knotweed if we can. We want to use science-based best practices and again I've got some resources to share on what we know about knotweed and what we know is going to be most successful. The recommended control method um, is a targeted herbicide application. So we know that decades of research in our region um, with manual control and mechanical control and not weed suggests that that's not an effective control method. That if you're going to um, be working on not weed, you should include some sort of herbicide application as part of your plan. There are some exceptions with that. Of course, if there's a safety issue, if um, there's an imminent danger or you need to access you know infrastructure or, or something like that and, and there are cases that I know of where um, this has happened um, you know cutting the knotweed down is going to be the most um, the fastest way to get rid of it and so of course if there's safety concerns or other situations there are some exceptions to that rule but we do know that mechanical and manual control methods on their own are not likely to be affected, effective on the knotweeds. And like with any invasive species project, a long-term commitment has to be um, understood. Um, these invasive species are not easy to deal with. Um, otherwise, there wouldn't be an entire job dealing with these things. And so you definitely have to consider, um, you know, when you deal with knotweeds, it's going to be many years before a patch might get eradicated. In some cases, it might be a forever project. You might always be monitoring the site to make sure that the invasive that you're working on is not coming back. And that monitoring is essential. Um, it's, it's very rare to undertake a management activity once at an invasive species site and then call it done and not have to go back. Monitoring is really essential to see how effective your, your plan was and to catch any you know, new growth or seedlings that might have come up since the last time you were there. And, and in many cases, a lot of the sites we work on, it's a multi-year project for sure. I also want to mention that the, the knotweeds are invasive in other parts of the world as well. Of course, they're native to regions in Asia, but they're invasive in many other continents and they're actually one of the world's worst 100 invasive plants. And so um, there's lots of information out there and lots of people that are dealing with knotweeds. Some of the other considerations about knotweed that I wanted to share is that management around water is restricted. So working around water is always a bit tricky because those are really sensitive habitats. Um, but especially if you're using herbicide around water, there are a lot of restrictions about that. Our advice for residents who have knotweed on their property is that you probably want to consult a professional or a science-based resource if you're wanting to undertake control yourself. And there's a photo on the, the top there of um, knotweed adjacent to somebody's fence. And I get calls every year from people that have knotweed on their property or their neighbor has knotweed on their property or entire neighborhoods you know have knotweed on their property or perhaps it's in the back lane and it's really a municipal responsibility and and they're trying to work with their local government to get that knotweed patch control and um, it's always really complicated and, and knotweed is such a complex plant that often I like to work one-on-one -on -one with people to help them decide what's going to be best for them but when it comes to knotweed my best advice 
is that people should probably consult a professional and definitely do their research. So because of the specific management recommendations for knotweed, we recommend that volunteers can report or monitor and provide education on knotweed, but it's not a great volunteer candidate plant, simply because volunteers are typically not applying herbicide. Um, they're more likely doing manual or mechanical control, and as we know, that doesn't work on knotweed, and so it's not a great plant for volunteers to be managing on the ground. Again, with the exception of helping to report or maybe monitor sites or help provide community education on the species. So some of the resources I wanted to share, we have a regional brochure. Um, I do have hard copies of these if you wanted a copy. And um, it replaces a really old help stop the spread brochure that um, was developed um, many, many years ago. And so this brochure is, you know, kind of what I would take if I was going to a farmer's market and setting up a booth or a community event. It's got some basic information about invasive species. And then on the inside, we've got some photos of the top invaders that we deal with in Metro Vancouver. So that's a, a great one for just a, a public audience. Um, my website, iscmv.ca, also bcinvasives.ca, which is the website for the Invasive Species Council of BC, and they have a multitude of resources on there. Um, if any of you find yourselves uh, learning from home these days or um, homeschooling your children or children that you know, BC Invasives is a great place to go. They've got tons of resources for kids and for youth and for teachers and information on invasive plants across the province. And so I encourage you to check that out. GrowGreenGuide.ca is another awesome website. This one's from the Metro Vancouver Regional District and you can see a screenshot there on the very bottom. And the tagline of this program is it's a guide to eco-friendly lawns and gardening in Metro Vancouver. So it's a great place to go if you want information about um, what plants should I plant in my small space? How do I do container gardening? All those kinds of things you can find on the Grow Green website. Now, all the information that I've discussed previously about knotweed specifically can be found in the resources on this page. So there are a series of regional best management guides that are fairly technical. Um, they're for use by people like me and contractors and other people whose jobs it is to manage these things. And so far we have guides for 11 species in Metro Vancouver, including the knotweed species. You can see a picture of the knotweed BMP on the screen there. And I encourage you to check out that document for everything you ever wanted to know about knotweed species and probably more. And you can find that link on the bottom there. That resource is actually available on the Grow Green website. So a faster way to find it might be to go to the green, growgreenguide.ca and search for invasive species and you'll be able to find those. I'll also mention that coming later this year, we have four additional BMPs for reed canary grass, wild turtle, purple loosestrife, and yellow flag iris if those happen to be in your hit list. So I encourage you to contact us for more support and resources after tonight um, for any invasive related question that you might have. Again, my website is there. We also have a Facebook page, Instagram account, and Twitter account. You can also join our regional listserv to find out about news, events, jobs, anything invasive species related happening in the region. And I'm really excited to announce we have a new YouTube channel. So I mentioned that um, many of our events, unfortunately, in the last few weeks and then moving into the summer have been canceled. And so we've been trying to think of new ways to transition into educating and training people online. And so we already have a few uh, videos on our YouTube channel. Um, a lot of them are just how to ID certain things, how to manage certain things, and they're all just a couple of minutes long. And so um, they're not a big time investment to learn something new about invasive species. So if you just go to YouTube and search for ISCMB, you'll easily find us. Some other upcoming events that you might be interested in. May is Invasive Species Action Month in BC. Um, and so it's a time where people around the province are really focusing efforts on holding events, which will happen in a different way this year um, and sharing information and blasting social media all about invasive species. And so if you're really into invasive species or part of your work involves invasive species, maybe consider how you can promote Invasive Species Action Month. So the Invasive Species Council of BC is hosting a number of different events. They're hosting a virtual youth summit on May 1st and 2nd online. Uh, May 6th, they're holding a webinar 
um, from Broom Busters, which is a volunteer group on the island. So they're going to be talking about how to manage scotch broom. We are going to be doing a Facebook Live hanging basket workshop probably before Mother's Day. So we were intending for this to be a live event in our field house where we invited people to come and make hanging baskets. But now we're going to do it on Facebook Live. So we're going to send out um, a list of ingredients that you need beforehand. Um, if people want to actually um, follow along or they can just watch the video live and it'll be available afterwards as well. So the whole idea is that many hanging baskets that you can readily buy in garden centers have invasive plants in them. So we want to teach people how to make their own using non-invasive plants. May 13th, there's another webinar that the ISCBC is hosting called Play Clean Go and that's all about educating recreational and outdoor enthusiasts about not spreading invasive species. And one of my most favorite events that we held the last two years was an invasive species cook-off right here at the field house. And so we were intending to host that again this year in July, but I don't think that's going to be possible. So we're trying to rethink how we might offer that event online. Um, the whole idea was people gathered for a meal that was made up of dishes um, that had an in invasive species ingredient in them. So that was a really fun way to um, share a meal and also discuss invasive species so not sure when or how that's going to happen but stay tuned and again information about all of these events can be found on those two websites below so here's my contact information i welcome you to contact me after today please remind me that you did this session um, so that I, I know where we met and i would also like to acknowledge the financial assistance of the province of bc which allows us to provide um, these kinds of outreach opportunities so I understand that we're holding questions and comments until the end, but I'm looking forward to being with you throughout the session um, to help you learn more about knotweed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tasha. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so if you, if you do have questions right now, you can uh, put them in the chat box down there at the bottom, just type them in and then, um, yeah, everyone can kind of see what they are and or, you, or you're welcome to hold them to the end as well. But um, yeah, you can pop them in the check box if you don't want to forget them right now. Um, so I'm going to jump right into introducing our next two speakers. Um, so that's Amy Hendel and Fiona Steele of uh, Diamond Head Consulting. Um, and they're just pulling up the PowerPoint there now. But um, yeah, um, we, I'll let you folks uh, kind of give introduce yourselves but we're really excited to um have amy and fiona um i was talking to krista voth who's also here tonight and can answer some questions at the end but um she suggested bringing um amy and fiona on and uh yeah i'm really excited to hear about their work and uh they they do a lot of work with knotweed so i think um it should be really informative Great, thanks Emma, and thank you so much for having Amy and I on tonight. Um, Amy, do you want to pull up our PowerPoint? Yes, I did share <laughs> screen. Does that no one can see it? We can just see your. Um, we can't see the PowerPoint. We just see your file explorer. That's funny. Want to try? Oh. Try again, maybe? Yeah, I'm trying again. Oh, there it is. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm Fiona. I'm one of the owners, co-owners, and a senior biologist at Diamond Head Consulting. Um, and Amy, who's also going to be doing most of this presentation, is our field operations manager. And I'll let her introduce herself when um, we get to her part. I'm just going to do a quick introduction about what we're going to talk about and about Diamond Head and then I'll pass it over to Amy who's going to tell you all about all the knotweed work that Diamond Head does. So um, Amy will talk about spread for, oops we lost your screen again Amy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mind me guys. <laughs> So Amy is going to talk about there we go awesome and so it, we see who we are and then we go <laughs> <laughs> 
treatment methods, how we deal with knotweed in riparian areas, about the pesticide certification that's required and public notifications and data collection. Um, so just to give you a little background, Diamond Head is a small environmental consulting firm based here in Vancouver. Um, we specialize in planning, environmental planning, biological inventory and assessment, arboriculture, urban forestry, um, ecosystem restoration, and tree care. So we have quite a few different uh, parts to our company. So the part that Amy and I are most involved with is our ecological restoration wing where we have up to 10 operational crews. So half of our crews are focused on manual invasive plant removal and restoration planting and everything that goes along with ecosystem restoration such as um, stream and wetland rehabilitation, enhancements for wildlife habitat and sediment and erosion control. And then Amy runs um, five specialist invasive species crews that just focus on knotweed and giant hogweed. So she's going to tell you all about that work. Hey guys, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I've been working with knotweed. This is my 11th year just with knotweed. Um, I do also other invasive species and I've been working in Metro Vancouver since uh, summer of 2007 with uh, wildlife fish and invasive species. But 11 years just with knotweed. Um, so Diamond Head started, started a herbicide application in 2012. Um, we have 15 local, provincial, and federal government clients, and we work all over Metro Vancouver from West Van to Abbotsford is our jurisdiction. Um, we work with private landowners, um, residential, and developers. And last year we had about 3,500 or more knotweed sites that we manage and monitor. So many of these sites were still doing treatments and a lot of these sites were just monitoring. So making sure we're catching the regrowth from the knotweed. So prior to doing a knotweed treatment program, it's very important that you do some spread prevention. So April is the time to do that because that's when the knotweed starts to emerge. And on the picture on the left there, you can see the red, uh, the pink flagging tape with these wooden stakes. So this is a, a site in Port Moody that we have. And we place these, um, install these knotweed barriers, mow barriers in the spring to prevent city mowing crews from mowing the knotweed. And prior to that, we always do a, a kind of like a, a PowerPoint presentation with those crews to let them know what knotweed is and not to mow it. And sites that are near a sidewalk or a roadway, we put these mow barriers so they don't get mowed. Um, the picture on the right, instead of having a knotweed mow barrier, sometimes we'll put a sign, depending on the municipality that you work in. So that's a city of Surrey sign. So it says invasive plants, knotweed, do not mow. Um, because cutting knotweed will spread the fragments everywhere and we grow new plants. So we want to put those barriers in place before we actually go and do the treatment. Another important um, tool before we start our knotweed treatment programs is education. Um, this is an, an example of a city of Burnaby site. Um, there's a knotweed educational sign with some snow fencing and a dog park. So we had a dog park that had a lot of knotweed. Um, it's good to put the snow fencing so the animals don't run through it and spread the knotweed. Like Tasha said, knotweed can spread from the fragment the size of your pinky, two milligrams. Um, so we like to keep it undisturbed. And also for protection, because when we do do a targeted herbicide application, we don't want the dogs to run through it. Um, so education, spread prevention is very important before we start knotweed treatments. So I'm going to just talk about um, different treatment methods. Um, the first one is manual. Um, this isn't recommended for many reasons um, because it doesn't target the underground rhizomes. Um, smothering, mowing, pulling, digging, cutting, steaming, burning, just top kills the plant, but we want to focus on the rhizomes. 
So it's not effective control method. Um, it's also time consuming and labor intensive and often promotes spread. Um, cultural. So this is grazing, goats, cattle. Um, it doesn't control the root system underground. Um, the animals can leave behind plant fragments and seeds. And it's limited in urban areas due to municipal bylaws regulating agricultural animals and it causes damage to riparian and other sensitive areas. Um, you know, in the, t in the interior, they have lots of programs actually, um, it's called Goats on Weed. And the goats go and graze common tan tansy, um, nap weeds, those kind of rangeland weeds. Um, but here in a city setting, in the south coast, it's very hard to have a herd of goats going around eating knotweed. It's also trampling the soil and um, spreading fragments of knotweed around, and that's how they grow. So the recommended is chemical. So we use a systematic herbicide um, that's very effective, and it's glyphosate, um, to target um, knotweed plants. Um, it's targeted application where we spray diluted herbicide onto the leaf of the plant or we inject into the cane. Um, control method is used, it's determined by the site. So I'll have a few slides coming up um, explaining how we do the treatments. Sometimes we'll do spray, sometimes we'll do stem ejection, and sometimes we'll do a combo. So our treatment timing. So knotweed is merging now and it's growing really, really fast, but it's not ready for treatment yet because it's actively growing. It's putting all the sugars down into the root system to keep growing faster and faster and faster. So the best time to target it is in early May, middle of May, and you can keep doing treatments up until the first hard frost, which is early November, late October, depending on the year. But here in the south coast, we have a longer season, growing season, so we can treat knotweed even up to the first week of November. But it, most of it, the time, it starts to die off in mid-October, end of October, it turns yellow. Um, we have six months to do treatments because we have a lot of sites to visit as well. Um, it's best to target it in spring to late summer, the first treatment, and then we do a second treatment in late summer into early fall. And I find it's best to do your first treatment before the end of July, um, just because the blackberries are coming out. Knotweed likes to grow with blackberries, and you also have bees. And knotweed produces flowers late July all the way into September, and the bees like to be on the flowers. So we like to have the first treatment of knotweed done before that. Um, to avoid conflict. Um, you can do stem injection with the bees and the flowers because you're targeting into the stem. Um, but we like to do the first treatment before that and then we do a follow-up monitoring treatment in the late summer early fall. So we need to monitor for regrowth because the first treatment doesn't kill all the knotweed. It's a very hardy root system like Tasha said it goes down three meters and out 20. So it can put up shoots any time of the summer. So we want to catch those later in summer, early fall. So for chemical, our application methods that we use are stem injection and foliar spray. So stem injection uses 100% herbicide. Sometimes we dilute it to 50-50 with water and herbicide. Um, we use glyphosate. Um, we target the stem above the second node, just like you see in that picture there. Um, and we squirt one five mil squirt of herbicide into the stem. So the stems have to be at least a minimum of two centimeters diameter. So not every stem is that big. Um, on the right side, you see the slide, she's targeting plants that are, have skinny stems, so we can't do herb uh, stem injection. So we do a targeted spray of diluted herbicide, so it's mixed with water, onto the leaf. Not to the point of runoff, but just a light spray onto the leaf. And with spraying, we don't do it when it's rainy. 
We don't do it when the temperature is above 28 degrees Celsius or winds that are more than eight kilometers. Um, this is a nice big patch of Himalayan knotweed. So Himalayan is very different than giant Bohemian and Japanese. Um, not many people know what Himalayan look like and we don't have a lot of sites in Metro Vancouver that look like this. So um, this one is in Port Moody. So I just wanted to show a picture of us applying herbicide to, to Himalayan. So Himalayan, you cannot, you can stem inject, but it's very skinny stems and it's a very, very dense patch. So we did a herbicide application to this patch and Himalayan is shallow rooted compared to the other three types of knotweed. So um, this herbicide treatment did very well. And I think the following year where we were able to do some restoration planting on this site in a park in Port Moody. And um, we did restoration planting and the next year there were some small regrowth coming back of the Himalayan. So we just did some spot treatments to that site. And um, we only had a couple square meters of regrowth this, this last summer. So that was a really success. I'm just going to show you some pictures of these big knotweed sites that we have to manage. And imagine trying to dig this one out. So it's hard to see, but to the left of that telephone pole and all the way to the end of that picture is knotweed. It's on a really steep slope on that Barnet Highway. So um, trying to dig this out or having goats eat this would be very, very difficult. But um, a site like this, we, we would kind of inch away at it each year. So we would do a spray around the perimeter. And then the next treatment, we would go inside and inject each stem as much as we can or as much as budget would allow for us. And eventually, you know, we, we shrink the size and we, we would get, um, you know, at least 99% control. I don't say eradicate it all the time because knotweed is funny. It can lay dormant for almost 20 years and come back. So we can get a really good efficacy after the first year of treatment for a site like this. So um, probably 70% and then we inch away at it each year. And a site like this, um, it was causing sightline issues on the highway and there's a lot of public complaints also growing above the power below the power lines. And um, it was being mowed up quite often. So it was getting spread a lot. So we informed them that they should not be mowing it and to leave this site alone. So this one has been a big project. It's only its second year of treatment. Um, this is another site in Surrey where it's a capital works project. So it's something that's gonna be built here in the near future. Um, so we had to, deal with this as soon as possible. We can't just inch away at it each year like we try to do with some sites. So I say you should never cut knotweed, but um, this one we actually put trails through it with a brush saw. So we could stand on a ladder and spray as much as we could. And then the remaining knotweed after the, the spray treatment, which got rid of about 70, 80, it's always 70 or 80% of a site this size. Um, we went and stem injected the large canes um, because it's so it's too tall. Some of it's too tall to spray. So you have to use different management options and integrated pest management to to deal with some of these larger sites. But um, the chemical treatment works very well. This is still Creek and Burnaby up by uh, Dick's Lumber across from Home Depot. If you're familiar with that, just along the Greenway, Central Valley Greenway. And uh, I'm getting into our riparian issues. So unfortunately, we couldn't do anything here because in BC, we have restrictions with herbicide. Glyphosate is one meter from the high water mark. So the high horizontal wetted mark, um, one meter, we cannot use glyphosate. Any other herbicide is 10 meters. So that's why we use glyphosate because it has the best results and it, it's actually less toxic than some of the other chemicals um, that we could potentially use here in BC, but they're not regulated. Um, so this was a, a project we tried to treat the knotweed, but unfortunately we could only treat a portion of it. And because we could only treat a portion of it and not the knotweed in the zero to one high meter mark, it grew back. 
So if you can't treat all of it, then you have the potential or it does, you know, grow, grow back because it's all connected. So this little diagram I like to use. So it, we have pesticide free zones. Um, so you have the water body with that HWM, the high water mark, one meter, and then 10 meter pesticide free zone. Um, so with application of glyphosate from the backpack, for using our backpack or handheld sprayer, we have to have that one zero to one meter buffer. So one meter up and same, same with stem, stem injection, um, one meter up. So a lot of our creeks, rivers, um, waterways here in Metro Vancouver, there's a lot of untreated knotweed. <laughs> and it just keeps going back into the area where we're treating knotweed. Not aggressively, but it does grow back in. Um, and these are a couple of our crew that's been with Diamond Head for a couple of years, and they're just exhibiting some of the PPE that we wear. So a lot of people ask, like, what do you wear? But we wear rain gear, and we wear chemical resistant gloves. Um, for knotweed, uh, a, like a patch that they're at right now, um, we don't need to wear a respirator. It would take probably two minutes to spray that. Um, for a long, for large, large sites, we'll wear a re respirator. Um, it's not recommended on the MSDS forms, but we we will wear it for large sites that we're doing um, a lot of work in. But I use this picture because that's probably about the average size of a site that we manage. So we have 3,500 to 4,000 sites. And they're, they're, I think they're about average this size. There's lots of big ones, but um, we don't wear the respirator, um, goggles, that kind of um, PPE for really small sites because it's actually a very quick treatment. And like I said, it's diluted herbicide target to the leaf. You don't do it when it's windy. You don't do it when it's really hot. You don't do it when it's raining. So to to apply herbicides for noxious weeds, um, you have to have the certificate industrial vegetation management. A lot of people get confused. They have a landscape management um, certificate. And that's just for, I guess, landscapers working in horticultural beds or stratas or stuff like that. But for noxious weeds, we have the industrial vegetation management certificate. You can either get a one year or five year, depending on your score. You make below 75, you get one year, and you make above, you get the five year. Um, and I have mine there. <laughs> you see where I live. And uh, <laughs> I get the five years, so I guess I'm smart. <laughs> but uh, if so, many of our crews, uh, they start on um, the second thing here, I have the assistant applicator. So when we first start working, we, have, we go online and do the Ministry of Environment um, assistant applicator. So it just gives you some basic knowledge about how to apply pesticides, herbicides um, to different areas, all the different rules. And it's kind of a good warm up to doing the industrial vegetation management, which is a three hour exam. Um, before we go to a site, we post signage. Um, I showed you that education and spread prevention signage before. So some of the municipalities we work in, they create their own signage, which is really great. You need to do that before you do any knotweed treatment, especially in Metro Vancouver. So people know what's going on. And um, then what we do before we go out and do the treatment, and it depends on municipal bylaws. Most people are 24 hours beforehand, we'll put the signs up. We'll flag the sites. We put these nice pink tape. This is invasive plant management. Um, so people are aware of, you know, associate the plant with the picture. Um, some places, uh, for example, City of North Van, there's 72 hours, Burnaby 72 hours. So um, every, you have to check the bylaw of the municipality you're working in. And, um, place the signs prior to treatment. If it's an, actually in a really high use park, you put the signs up a couple days beforehand and you know really flag off the site so people know what we're doing. And when our crews are on the ground, we're always doing outreach and education all the time. So if we see people walk by and they look like they're kind of interested, we'll go talk to them and spend a little time with them and explain to them what we're doing. Um, so it's really important to do that prior to treatment. 
And the sign has everything that the province requires for um, herbicide applications. So we have to put what kind of application, any important details on the sign. Um, sometimes we write a little bit more information at the bottom where between pesticide use license and precautions. Um, what herbicide we use, um, our pesticide use license is very important. PCP number, which is the pest control product number. So people can look it up and read about it. Um, and contact information. Sometimes it's Diamond Head, sometimes it's the municipality that we're working in. Um, and the major thing that we do is we always collect data because we do reports for every um, municipality that we work in. We give a yearly report. Um, so we collect data on um, everything. Every site has a site ID, um, site history, um, who did the treatment, when it was done, a meter square treated, untreated area. So treated, so area that's in the riparian zone. So we know how much untreated knotweed we're dealing with. If it's an old site, new site, new discovery, um, type of herbicide, dilution of herbicide, um, how much herbicide we use, temperature, wind, photo, comments. So we do that for every single site and we tailor it to the municipal municipality that we're working in. So if they want certain pieces of information from us, we tailor each treatment form to that. And the picture that you see now is on ARC Collector. That's the app that we use for most of our big clients. And we also um, record the riparian status too. So similar to untreated area in riparian. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Amy and Fiona. <laughs> That's all. Um, yeah, so you, you guys are, are finished, is that? Yeah, yeah. I could talk more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's already- I almost feel like I had more slides, this thing's short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, so maybe we'll move on to that soon. Oh, mm -hmm. and I just, um, we have a look here. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm so glad that people have been starting to ask questions. And I think what I'll do is I can kind of read out the questions that are in the chat in order. And then once we get through those, um, I mean, you can keep popping questions in the chat if you want, or once we get to the end of them, we can, people can kind of ask, just ask their question if that's easier. Um, yeah, and I think uh, Krista is here. Is that right, Krista Voth? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm Hi. Back. <laughs> um, Hi. I just want to mention that uh, Krista Voth is here and uh, from the Vancouver Park Board, um, and uh, she might be able to answer some some questions that are like kind of more specific to parks potentially. Um, yeah, and yeah, I just wanted to offer if you wanted to say anything uh, before we jump into Q&A. Yeah, I guess um, in parks right now, uh, we're doing an inventory. Uh, Diamond Head is actually doing an inventory of our invasive plants, including Japanese knotweed and 35 other, around 30 other plants um, in parks so that we have a better understanding of how to prioritize um, treatment and in combination with that also a, a strategy, um, invasive species strategy to help us um, uh, prioritize species treatment and restorate post treatment restoration and um, allow us to have a holistic approach to, to managing invasives and um, targeting certain areas. So that's led by um, operations and I'm supporting that project as well um, in, in, in planning. So um, we'll see that has to be the strategy uh, will be presented to the board when it is completed and then uh, the Vancouver Park Board will uh, uh, review it and, and see if they'll adopt it as a strategy for us to, to use. That's where we're at with invasive species, and particularly with Japanese knot. We do we do do a little bit of um, contract treatment yeah, for some sites each year, um, but right now it's at a very small scale, and not at a scale and um, 
pace that will, uh, is actually um, getting ahead in, in some of the areas. So I think this will, hopefully a strategy will, and inventory will help us um, manage our, the invasive species, and especially the Japanese knotweed better. Yeah. Awesome, thanks Krista. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so I will jump into reading some of the questions from the chat, um, and I think, yeah, I, I think whoever feels kind of called to answer it um, can can jump in. Um, some of them might make more sense to some of you than others. So um, yeah, so the first question that we have is from Jennifer. Uh, why wasn't morning glory slash bindweed on that list of invasive species? I'll start with that one and then there's the, some follow-ups. but. Sure, I can take that one. So I know in the beginning of my presentation, I gave some examples of invasive species. I didn't actually provide a list of everything that's invasive in the region because if I had, Morning Glory would definitely have been on there. And I was promoting our YouTube channel earlier. I did a bunch of video shots in my own garden last week because Morning Glory is probably the worst invasive that I deal with on my um, property. And so at some point in the next week or two, there'll be a video on that. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those best management guides for morning glory, but if you want to get in touch with me offline, I can give you some hints, but I'll tell you right now, it's not easy. I probably say that about all invasive species, but morning glory for sure. Um, it's, it's really, really challenging, especially on residential property. Okay. Thanks, Tasha. Um, does the herbicide treating, okay, so this is, yeah, do, this is the next question. Does the herbicide treating the knotweed get into the rest of Still Creek's environment? Um, and are the blackberries safe to eat? I think that was meant um, okay. Yeah. If knotweed was treated in Still Creek? Mm -hmm. Or that was it still, from the picture I had of Still Creek? Um, not, yeah, so when we treat knotweed with glyphosate, like I said, um, it's targeted to the leaf. The only, the only person, the only, the only um, uh, person that's actually have it would be exposed to it would be the applicator if they weren't had their PP on. So it's targeted, spread onto the leaf. It doesn't go into the air and circulate everywhere. Um, if it's done correctly, so we're all trained, or di direct stem injection, so it goes right down through the stem into the rhizomes. It doesn't like leak out into the soil. Um, it has a half-life of 14 days, um, and it's out of the environment within six, 30 to 60 days. There's no residual activity. Um, you know, if you were to spray knotweed that's hanging over into the creek, it could get into the, to the water, but it's very targeted application of glyphosate. And blackberries, um, if we have blackberries around knotweed, we just brush them down. Unfortunately, people don't get their berries, but we, we brush around the knotweed patch and we clip the berries off. A lot of people think they're off because we spray them with glyphosate, but we just clip them off and we, we prep the site prior and we, we target the knotweed. I mean, there's so many blackberries around and knotweed and blackberries don't always grow together. There's so many other blackberry patches you can get blackberries from. So that was also the reason Amy said we try to do it before the blackberries are out. Yeah, but sometimes you have situations where the timing doesn't always work out. So there's a knotweed with the blackberry, but you just do some site prep and some education outreach. Like I said before, with signage, you prep the site. Um, sometimes the city park crews um, will prep the site for us um, and make a big buffer, you know, three to five meters possibly. Um, it doesn't even drift that far if you just, it's like a little spray onto the leaf. So it's, it doesn't go out to the other blackberries. I'd be perfectly fine to eat blackberries one meter from a knotweed treatment. And I just wanted to add to what Amy was talking about in the beginning um, of her answer and just describe a little bit more about what kind of herbicide glyphosate is. So there are actually a number of different products that are allowed for use on knotweed on um, private and public property in BC, and they're all listed in the best management guide. But as Amy suggested in her presentation, glyphosate is by far the most common active ingredient that's used on knotweed. And glyphosate is considered a non 
residual herbicide, which means um, that it's there. These herbicides are active only on growing plant tissue and they have little or no persistence in the soil. There's a whole other class of herbicides called residual herbicides, which do persist in the soil. Sometimes they're used on purpose for invasive plants. They're sprayed on the plants and then they persist in the soil to help prevent new seedlings from coming up. Um, but glyphosate is not one of those persistent, um, persistent herbicides. Uh, so the next question is, uh, is herbicide dangerous for pets like cats and wildlife like birds and bees? Yeah, so we don't spray during um, treatment um, when bee, flowering not weed, the bees do like it, so we don't spray. Um, and if we come in situations, so I'll example Pacific Spirit Park, we've been doing treatments in there since 2012. Uh, and most of the knotweed is gone and there's a lot of trails in there there's a lot of dog walkers and um, what we do is we put signs there a couple days before um, most of the knotweed is away from the path so we don't have a lot of knotweed where the animals interact with it but if we do there are, are there are situations um, we you know two or three days beforehand we, we take our tape and we flag off the whole area and um, have our knotweed uh, herbicide sign to let people know and because we've been doing that every year people people know not to have their dogs there i have a dog too i mean i walk around vancouver parks all the time so just pull the dog away um we clearly flag off and mark off all our sites prior like you stayed in the third sorry maybe the sixth or seventh slide of my presentation where we had these educational signs with snow fencing um a herbicide uh, not with education sign i and also the city of Burnaby actually puts out a little doggy sign saying no pause on this or something. So we, we do those dog park sites about a week prior to the knotweed and they close them off to the public for um, 24 hours. And it's all snow fenced off. So we do a lot of those um, spread prevention and education um, signage in high use areas. Um, some knotweed sites we have in the middle of the forest, nobody would ever go there, so we post the sign the day before. But any high use park, we always do it a couple days prior. Doesn't matter what the municipal bylaw says, we'll do it a couple days prior just to, you know, ease people's nerves and talk to people before we do it. So, thanks. Um, so the next question, do you wear respiratory protection gear during application? I believe you covered that. Um, we got a bit into this one, but maybe if there's anything else to add, uh, can you explain how glyphosate works and how you control the spread to other plants and inhabitants of the environment? How do you control glyphosate onto other plants, like collateral damage? Mm -hmm. And also how, like how it works. Oh, so you spray, so you, when it's targeted and targeted to the leaf of the plant or the stem, like I mentioned before. So it translocates all the way down to the rhizomes, the food storage area of the plant, and it slowly kills the plant over about a month period. So if you're not trained properly, and if you're applying the herbicide on a windy day, a rainy day, or a very, very hot day, it can vaporize, um, and you're just it's not spraying the plant you're spraying, you'll have collateral damage. But if you're, you do it the proper way, just to the leaf, there's absolutely no collateral damage to other plants. It's impossible unless it's very, very windy or you don't know what the target species that you're doing. If you have no knowledge of plants and you don't know what knotweed looks like. Um, I've had probably in my 11 years of running crews and doing knotweed treatments, very minimal damage. Um, and it, it came maybe from a little bit of wind or something over to another plant, but it's very, very small area. So maybe a foot or something, but it's always targeted to the leaf. We don't spray to the point of runoff. Um, and it dries very quickly within about half an hour. And it takes about a month to slowly kill the plant and has no residual activity like Tasha mentioned before. Great. Um, can I just add to the question about like, well, how, what about like uh, juncos and other birds that might be like hopping around in the bottom? Um, 
my experience with knotweed is if you look at a, if you actually want to crawl through a knotweed patch, you actually see what's underneath there. It's all bare ground, has no vegetation. Um, most knotweed patches just have junk inside them. People just throw, it's a lot of knotweeds are found on the sides of roads, edges of forests, where the, there's not much life under there because the canopy of leaves shades out everything. So even if you did an application of herbicide to knotweed, it's just bare ground. Um, they're known to be allopathetic, so they, they produce a chemical that makes other plants not come around it. Um, as in bird activity, on like blackberry, which is invasive, I do see lots of birds. I rarely have, I've never seen a bird nest in a knotweed patch, and I rarely, you know, birds perch, but it, it's very rare. They provide no forage, no food, nothing for animals. So uh, that's why they're kind of so useless. Um, and they, they don't provide any kind of food or habitat or anything for any animal. So um, it's, it, it can happen though that um, birds can perch on. Um, I did notice though, there's some sites that we have out in Coquitlam where they have the Western toad migration and they actually move across um, a certain road there, Quarry Road up by Widge and Minicata Park. Um, and they, every July and August, they have the western toad migration so we time our treatments because there's a lot of knotweed on that road um, to avoid that and sometimes we not may not get a proper treatment in because we try to avoid that so you have to be kind of conscious of different migration habitats of different wildlife species and vivians and time your treatments around that timing and i just wanted to add it's it's actually really easier than people think to be targeted. I think sometimes when people think about herbicide application, they're thinking about, you know, these boom sprayers on the back of big trucks. And, and certainly that is a method for treating invasive species and weeds on maybe agriculture property or ranching property. But here on the South Coast, especially when we're treating knotweed, it's very, very easy to be targeted. And Amy showed some examples of her sites where it would be really easy to spray. And in the odd case where you have a site where there's just a few, you know, stalks of knotweed emerging through salmonberry or some other native plant or fern, um, the applicator might choose to do stem injection, in which case there is really no risk of herbicide getting onto any other plants. But one of the reasons why people who are applying herbicide on public property are required to have a pesticide applicator license is that you're, you're trained in all these regulations and rules about how to apply herbicides safely, not only for the applicator and for humans, but for the environment as well. Um, and yeah, I echo what Amy said. It's, um, there's really very little off, what we call off target damage, which means damage um, to other plants or other things um, when you're doing a targeted invasive species application. So does it become inert when it like when it hits the soil because the roots then contact the soil and the soil is full of living organisms and things as well. No, so it's, it, it stays in the root system. Um, uh -huh. If the herbicide falls into the soil, it has a half-life of 14 days. Okay. So it, after about a month or so, it's um, gone from the soil. So it's a non-residual residual herbicide. So there's, uh, there's some herbicides that will stay in the soil up to six months to a year that will inhibit growth of other plants. So even when you do a knotweed treatment, you want to do restoration afterwards. It's within a month after you can plant other plants and they can grow. So some other herbicides, you can't do that. You have to wait about a year, six months to a year before you can even do restoration. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next question is, um, are you tracking knotweed prevalence regionally and are you making progress on reducing cover? That sounds like a, a big question. Yeah, so we, our jurisdiction is Metro Vancouver. So we do, um, I mean, we work with the Invasive Species Council as well. So we cover West Vancouver to Lang Langley Abbotsford. And then after that, it goes on to the Fraser Valley and these Invasive Species Council. So. In, in BC, I, Tasha can correct me, but we have about 17 invasive species councils, I think. Um, oh, she's mute. But um, they have different contractors that do work in the region. Um, so our jurisdiction, I guess, is Metro. Squamish has their own. Um, the Coastal um, Invasive Species Council on the island has their own. So I've been um, 
I worked at the Invasive Species Council with Tasha for five years before I moved to Diamond Head, and I've been at Diamond Head for five years. So I've been doing 10 years of treatments here in Metro Vancouver. And I can say it takes at least a minimum, depending on the site size, of a three to five year commitment of at least two site visits a year, monitoring and treating your plants, because there's always going to be regrowth. So I, I believe you need at least five year minimum and up to two site visit two site visits a year to to uh, manage not weed properly. One of the challenges of tracking knotweed is that everybody's using different mapping programs. There isn't one database that everybody in the province or even everybody in the region is using. Generally, most municipalities have their own mapping program. And so even though they may have Diamond Head as a contractor who might be working for many of them, they sort of have their own ways of mapping and tracking. So it's a little bit difficult to make uh, regional generalizations about how we're doing. But in my experience doing this job for, uh, gosh, over 12 years, I think, um, definitely there are some municipalities that are probably close to eradicating their knotweed. There are definitely sites and areas that have eradicated their knotweed. And I think generally that's the goal for people. They want to minimize the spread. And the reason why they're spending their limited dollars and resources on fighting knotweed is that they have the intention of reducing its spread and getting rid of as much of it as they can. So that's, I think, still a common goal in the region is that we would, we would love to be knotweed certain areas and possibly certain jurisdictions might might get there. And so definitely I've seen progress in my time doing this work. Yeah, and I just want to say um, a lot of municipalities, I don't want to name everyone, but um, we've had sites that we take off the list that we haven't seen regrowth for three to five years and we add new sites. And they're all kind of based on, there's not weed everywhere, but we base it on priority. So site line issues, um, encroaching into the forest. Um, there's lots of um, priorities for different municipalities. So like I said, we kind of tailor it to what they want. Um, but there is a decrease. So once we take sites off the list, we'll add new sites. Awesome. All right. Um, so uh, this is a question from Gray. Uh, so if there's not weed in my backyard, I shouldn't have touched it. I dug up a ton, tore up a massive areas of the root system and replanted natives. Is that not recommended? I'd like to know if it works. <laughs> it depends on the site size. Yeah, in my experience, when people have done that, um, they never actually get rid of the knot weed. They're just kind of always, always fighting it. So um, if somebody like that had approached me ahead of time, my recommendation probably would have been call a contractor, you know, pay a small amount of money and, and use her or, or possibly apply the herbicide yourself to actually, um, you know, kind of get rid of it before you do the planting. Otherwise, there's always risk of it um, spreading because when you're cutting and digging, it's really difficult to remove the entire plant. Probably the entire plant was not removed. All right. Uh, how successful are knotweed in shaded areas? Next question from Gabriel. Let me answer. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the question is. Is it is it um, shade you know, tolerant maybe? Shade yeah. tolerant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of uh, like uh, how do they do under the canopy? This kind of mm -hmm. thing. Well, I, I think some not weed information out there says that they're not shade tolerant. They're like disturbed sites and open sites. But from my experience, it grows everywhere. Um, it is a little bit shade tolerant. So you'll see it on like an edge of a forest where it's a good sun. And then as it goes deeper in, it kind of disappears. Like, um, but it is, it, it is shade tolerant. There's, it's, it loves sunny sites. Um, disturbed sites. I mean, you even see it growing by the beach and it's like high sal salinity sites. So mm -hmm. I believe just from my experience and all the sites that we manage, it, it can grow anywhere. Um, but it can be a little bit shade tolerant, but it will still be under the canopy. You'll still find knotweed growing. It's very, it adapts very well. 
Yeah, in the, in the BMP, we note that the knotweeds can tolerate a wide variety of site conditions, including challenging environments such as highly shaded areas, areas with high salinity, high heat, or drought. But as Amy said, yeah, they probably prefer, you know, these riparian, you know, wetter areas with, um, with more sun. It doesn't really discriminate. <laughs> it'll, it'll live anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> All right. This is a question from Carla at Strathcona Community Garden. Um, is there educational signage available to post on public areas? How wide an area should we mark from the edge of the knotweed patch? Amy, do you want to talk about signage that you've used in the city of Vancouver that might be available? Well, we just have our herbicide signs, but um, there's different pro more more municipalities that are proactive than others. Depends on their knotweed problem. Um, I don't work a lot with the city of Vancouver knotweed. I just have a couple sites. But um, the city of Burnaby has really good signage, knotweed education. We have, it was one of our, our biggest clients. So we have a lot of knotweed in parks there. So they have a nice educational signage that we, we install on behalf of them. We don't make it here at Diamond Head. Um, um, but uh, the, like that picture I showed you in that educational signage slide, um, city of, the city of Burnaby has a good one. But, um, you know, we always, recommend to our clients to have that kind of signage and to do that beforehand and um, it's, it's up to them. I mean, we're the contractor to do the treatments. So we always have our um, provincial legislation signs up. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in uh, that for to informing the public to prevent the spread, we could definitely support that uh, the Vancouver Park Board for Community Garden. It's in the Community Garden, I think. That Carla mentioned, and um, so yeah, we could we could supply that. Excellent. Is there a Thank buffer you. that needs that it needs to stay within? Um, mm -hmm. That's what I'm wondering. We have it marked off with um, with caution tape right now, but there've been we're near that area. We we're trying to establish a pollinator garden, and we're just wondering how wide a swath we should have. Um, should we mark it the full 20 meters out from it? Or is there like an advised area from where the edge of the patch is growing if, you know, maybe a few meters out um, to rope that off as well? If you're going to be doing treatment in the Strathcona Community Garden with the knotweed? Or you just, are you not saying treatment there yet? No, not, for, not um, We've worked with the city of Vancouver as a contractor that does the treatment, but more so so that um, the public isn't walking through it and we're not, um, oh, yeah. like people are trying to grow other things near the knotweed. We have an area marked off where we're not touching anywhere where it's growing, but we're wondering how close could we, you know, put seeds down um, or, because there's been debate among gardeners of, you know, hey, this is, within 10 feet of the knotweed like don't even like touch the ground here to plant a seed and then there's other gardeners like hey we want to have some nasturtium growing here and it's not that close and people are debating that there's a water line and oh, the water line the knotweed is going to send the roots down to find the water line and we shouldn't be watering any plants anywhere near the knotweed so i'm just trying to understand what we should be advising folks because it's we've had some debate hmm I have to go to the site to see it first. <laughs> it's sort of tricky because there it's isn't tricky. really a set standard. Like we know the maximum length it could potentially grow, like yeah. the zone where roots could be, but it's not always practical to block that much land off. So it's sort of something, Amy, you kind of have, you decide on a case by case basis. Yeah, I like to do site visits and it just case by case. It's hard to... What? Every time I, I talk on the phone or email, it's hard to, if I'm there, I can, you know, give a good consultation about what to do, but um, I, I, just thinking about it now, I probably wouldn't have a large buffer. I mean, I should be fine to plant plants. But the main thing would be people not digging very deeply. You don't want to dis disturb right? the soil. I mean, you can still plant, 
and put your plants in, but you don't want to be moving the soil around because it stimulates growth as well. It could trigger growth in the knotweed. But I think even up to a meter from the knotweed patch, if you wanted to plant your plants, that's okay. But you just, you know, do it um, without disturbing it a lot. You don't want to be a lot of digging. If it's just, I don't, vegetable, I don't know what your flowers or vegetables or whatever you're planting, but um, that's what happens with the knotweed. When you start turning the soil, you germinate, you, like, you know, you start stimulating growth, will trigger stuff. So not, if the knotweed's kind of left as it is, it, it, it should probably stay there. It might put up shoots here and there. But um, if there was ever a, a treatment program at Strathcona, even if you did targeted herbicide to the leaf of the knotweed amongst native plants, you can still manage the knotweed with minimal or no collateral damage if you're a trained professional. I've worked in like green roofs treating knotweed in uh, uh, garden beds and had good results, you know, just, just very targeted application. Um, and it's good to have those other plants there to provide competition. Uh, I just want to note that we're at 830. There's still quite a few questions, um, but I just want to check in and see how you folks are feeling about it. I know it's been a, a long evening. Lots of lots of great questions, but are you okay to go on? Should we take a couple more questions? How are you feeling? Yeah. Okay. I uh, will keep working our way down and uh, yeah, it is 8.30 though, so understand if people need to take off at some point. Um, maybe, yeah, we'll try and limit new incoming questions. Uh, all right, so this is again from Gray Oren. On a different side, I'm controlling not weed in a riparian area. The water table is really high. It is a treed swamp uh, and the knotweed is right at the water line. Would pulling the knotweed not, would pulling the knotweed be, be the right thing to do within the one meter of the stream? Um, from my experience, it won't do anything. It will just go right back. It's also the, we generally avoid doing any kind of disturbance right in the water line just because then you might be um, causing disturbance to the creek through um, sedimentation. And unusually that knotweed has much longer roots so even if you do pull it out it's still going to come back so it's not really worth the risk to damaging the stream bed. If you're trying to dig it out it will cause a bank to erode and put sediment into the stream. And uh, you do more damage than good. Yeah, Gray has hit upon one of the region's most challenging aspects of managing knotweed. Amy showed the diagram and talked about the fact that um, with glyphosate products, you can only use within one meter of the high water mark. So between zero meters, the water, and that one meter mark, we really don't have a lot of good management options. That will probably change in the future, I suspect, but for right now, we don't have a lot of good suggestions for what to do there. So you're not alone in being stumped about what to do. And again, um, often that's on a case by case basis. And in many cases, we're just leaving that knotweed um, because any activity that we could do like pulling, like you suggest, or going in the stream and digging is likely of higher risk for, for that site. All right, from Aaron H, could invasive species reporting be included on the Van Connect app? Maybe that's a Kristen question. <laughs> yeah, we encourage people, you know, my, yeah, we encourage people to report on uh, Report a Weed. Um, then it goes to, um, that's with the Invasive Species Council of BC and um, the Ministry of BC and uh, Ministry of Environment. And so then it goes to, um, actually to Tasha, uh, if, if it's in this neighborhood and, or an area, and then um, they can inform us. So that's really the best. Tasha, do you have any further information about that? Or is that... Yeah, I, I should have included that slide in there, but there's a provincial reporting 
program. So there's a number of different ways you can report. The easiest and most fun way is you can download um, a free app for your phone. There's Report Invasives BC or Report a Weed. Report a Weed is the same thing, just only plants. And it allows you to report in live time um, a, a site. So you could be anywhere in the province and report a site. And you can also take a picture and add comments. And that gets sent to somebody at the province who then downloads reports to the local level. So people like me sift through them and figure out whose responsibility there are and what can be done about it. Um, if you don't have a smartphone or you don't have it with you, um, there's a report a weed online. So you can go to the form when you get back to a computer. And there's also a phone number that you can call to report that way as well. Um, all right, this is from Gabriel. Amy and Fiona, how is social isolation affecting field operations? Do you work in teams when you control invasive species and how are you coping with the distancing issue? Yeah, I'll answer that to give Amy a question break. <laughs> um, we are, we've reduced Amy's crews, for example, down, normally they work in pairs, but they're down to one person per vehicle. So we're only pairing them up if it's um, a, a really large site or there's a safety issue, in which case they would both arrive there in separate vehicles. Um, we're also not, we're checking in every day with all our crews as to make sure they're all still feeling healthy. If anyone's sick, they need to stay home. And we have a whole protocol for sanitation and keeping the trucks clean and supplying like hand sanitizers and cleaners. Mm -hmm. So those are the main differences for our crews at the moment. And just of note, under the provincial health officers list of essential services, vegetation management and restoration is included in that, which definitely includes invasive species management. So we're hoping that all of the work that's you know been ongoing that those projects will continue and that we won't miss a field season because the plants are still going to grow and we still need to maintain um, you know highways and right-of-ways and park safety and all that stuff so um, hopefully you'll see the work continuing as normal this summer just with the physical distancing measures in place. Yeah so I haven't known of any clients who have or any local governments who have cut knotweed treatment. They might have cut other types of invasive work, but not, not, not weeds still going on. Uh, from Julie, Krista, is the Park Board doing an inventory of the Renfrew Ravine? Is there any way to apply herbicide this year in the Renfrew Ravine if you were doing limited, <laughs> if you were doing limited X application prior to his Renfrew Ravine? That's, that's a statement, but okay. Yes, okay, so um, the inventory includes all park managed lands and um, so Renfrew Ravine is included on there and um, the sites for herbicide treatment are being reviewed by the integrated pest management uh, uh, lead and so um, it'll be prioritized based on a variety of um, uh, different, uh, different criteria, but that will be refined um, with the strategy. But right now, um, we don't do a lot of uh, spray treatment, and um, but we that that will really depend on the integrated pest management team. So so we'll we'll see. But it's on the list that I have uh, submitted of natural. Um, I submit all the invasive species um, management. Um, recommendations for natural areas and that was submitted uh, as a high priority. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, all right, this is a question from Krista. Tasha, Amy or Fiona, does the uh, riparian one meter pesticide free zone apply to ephemeral water bodies? So can you treat in um, ephemeral water bodies, I guess, I'm, I'm wondering. Like when they're dry? Right. So we basically, you know, in the time of year, so after a big rain, of course, it's going to be high water level. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll hold off on some riparian sites until 
late July, early August when things are pretty dry, um, like a, a, di a ditch that has flowing water. Um, some creeks though in North Vancouver can get very dry mineral water. Um, but I always consult with my municipality before we would do that. Um, there's not gonna be any rain in the forecast for at least 48 hours. Um, and we decrease the high watermark zone. Um, we'll treat not wheat. Um, the herbicide, like I said, dries very quickly and um, within a couple hours is already absorbed into the plant. Um, but if there's a huge rain event in the future, we, we won't treat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just mention too, it's actually even more complicated than what Amy um, included in her presentation. Like it's the regulations around water bodies is actually pretty complex. There's a technical definition of what a water body is and most yeah. things that we think of as water bodies would fall under that, but there are some that do not. And then there's special rules around those. So um, there's a lot of fine print in the legislation, I guess I'll say. And again, it's a reason why pesticide applicators have to have special training is because you have to be aware of all those pieces of legislation that have to be followed if you're if you're working on public property. Um, the next question is from January. Uh, what can I do if there is not weed in my neighbor's yard and they won't do anything to remove it? <laughs> you can give them a brochure. Yeah, that's a tough one. If somebody gave me a call, yeah, my recommendations would be, do you know your neighbor? Are you on a first name basis? Are you comfortable sharing what you know about knotweed? Um, sometimes the answer is yes. They just might need a little bit of support in knowing what kind of education they're providing for their neighbor. Other times the answer is, I don't even know who the neighbor is. It could be a non-existent, um, you know, like a, an absentee um, owner or something. And so sometimes people will, you know, indiscreetly slip brochures into mailboxes, but other times it requires perhaps calling the municipality and making a complaint. And there's varying levels of response that municipalities in Metro Vancouver can provide when complaints are made of this nature on, on private property. But it's a challenge and because enforcement is really not a main activity when it comes to invasive plant management, nobody gets or rarely would anybody get a bylaw notice because they have a base of plant on their property. Um, if, if people can be good neighbors and use education as a tool um, to get work done, that's the approach that I encourage. Uh, all right, so next question from Virginia. What about insects and birds eating the insects? I assume that's about herbicide application? Well with knotweed, on, on, in, honestly, a lot of in, insects don't really eat it. That's why it's invasive. So in Japan, where it's very native, they have lots of insects to keep it in check and eat it. So it's not invasive. Um, I've rarely, I, I don't think I've seen any insect damage to knotweed leaves. I've seen environmental damage like drought and stuff like that, but that's why it's invasive because our native animals and insects don't eat it and don't live in it, don't, don't use it for anything really. Okay, uh, this is a comment from Julie. There's young growth next to the steps leading down to run for ravine boardwalk. So it's important to remove these before they spread to the creek. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a kind of a, a, a comment here from, from Genevieve. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> hi, Genevieve. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're interested in, uh, in having some follow-up conversations with folks offline about, about your work, um, which sounds yeah. really great. Mechanical removal, I just want to highlight the need where I live um, in working in co-governance with our local tribes. So that's a really important part of our, of our situation. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, this, I think this question has kind of been answered from Krista, but uh, would it be appropriate to carefully hand dig newly established knotweed in riparian areas? 
decided that was no. I think that's answered, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that's actually the last question. And it is 8.45. Um, so I think I'll say, unless there's anything super burning that's coming up, but thank you so much to um, Amy, Fiona, Tasha, and Krista for um, being able to share some of your knowledge and um, come out and, and do these presentations and answer the very many questions that we had. I know, um, yeah, I, I think I've, I've said it a couple times, there's always a lot of questions about, particularly about knotweed, so um, I think it was really great that you're able to to kind of address a lot of those those questions especially. Um, and we're really grateful that you're able to join us online for this forum. Yes, Thank thanks you. so much. If you have more questions, just email me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And yeah, as I mentioned, I did record this, so um, I will send it out to folks. Um, and uh, yeah, you're, you, can, you can watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks for hosting. Bye. 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 Bye.